the Omega Beam. Full power. Welcome to the Omega Beam. I'm your host, Oren Merton. In this episode, we're going to talk about Season 1 of Andor, the latest live-action Star Wars show streaming on Disney+. Plus. So for those not familiar with the character of Cassian Andor, he was one of the main protagonists in Rogue One, the recent Star Wars movie that was a direct prequel to 1977's Star Wars, which was later renamed Star Wars A New Hope because it became part of this longer story. This TV series is a prequel to the prequel, and we get to follow Cassian Andor before the events of Rogue One and see how he got to the point that we met him at there. Golden and I start spoiler-free, but we do go full spoiler after that, so keep that in mind. And all right, let's get into it. I am here with Golden to talk about Andor Season 1, the latest Star Wars series streaming in its entirety on Disney+. Plus. This series is a bit longer. I think it had 12 episodes or 13 episodes. Normally they've been 12. Eight or 12. Yeah, normally they've been 8 or 10. I think we both loved Rogue One, the movie that introduced us to Cassian yeah, I, Andor. I thought Rogue One was just a standalone, incredibly well done movie. Yeah, and spoiler alert Cassian Andor and everybody does not make it out of that movie. No, so, some, some do, but. Anyone that goes down there doesn't. Right, right. So this is the prequel that basically shows us how Cassian Andor goes from sort of street rat to major... Resistance. Resistance leader, or at least spy and assassin. And this was not a series that I needed. I, when they announced they're doing... You know that you need it. Yeah, exactly. When they announced Andor, I was just like, oh, right, Cassian Andor, yeah, he was fun. Okay, I guess they really need to mine, you know, deep to, to get new series. All right, well, you know, could be good. And then we saw the first trailer, and that was pretty intriguing. It's like, okay, this doesn't look like the other series. This seems like it's its own thing. And then the actual series hit. And what did you think? I... And we didn't actually watch it right away. Yeah. I know that I read a couple of people I know on Facebook saying that, you know, they've been waiting their whole life for this series, for this type of, this this show. Because, okay, fine, it's in the Star Wars galaxy, but for people that are Star Wars fans, you know some of these people, but you could completely remove this from the Star Wars universe, and it's still just an excellent show. Yeah, this is just a great story. I read one of my friends write, and I would agree with this, that one of the great strengths of the Star Wars sagas in general that makes them kind of universal in all ages is that they are children's stories that can be enjoyed by adults. And that's not an insult to call them children's stories. not saying they're shallow or whatever. It's saying that they are the kind of simple but engaging story that anyone of any age can can get into. And that's that's been one of the things that has kept Star Wars alive so long. Andor is an adult series, and I don't mean that because they're swearing all the time or because it's particularly bloody or sexy, but it deals with adult themes and it doesn't feed them to you in a way that is obvious for people who haven't, you know, experienced lots of either life or stories or whatever. It is, it is meant for people who are more mature, and that's kind of a first in the Star Wars universe. And I think they did it extremely well. Andor, Cassian Andor, is a character who he only lives in the shades of gray. He is not the White Knight or the Black Knight, which is basically Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. He is a shadow warrior, and yet basically on the good side, because he kind of hates the bad guys more than anyone else. But this series, it is more complex, and it shows you what the repercussions of conquest are, of losing autonomy are, what the human cost of waging this kind of battle against tyranny is. And you don't see that. 
other than in, in particularly superficial ways in the other shows, because they're m much more interested in the heroic tale. And this is not a heroic tale. This is a grim, tense tale. Expertly acted, expertly written. The effects are amazing. Well, because it's not all done on the volume. Right. This, 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 was, this was, you know, more real sets and things like that, yeah. so... And you can tell, I mean, it, it feels it's more a, grounded, literally. Yeah, it, it does. It, fe it feels bigger. You know, the, the, the volume is great for creating vast worlds, but at the same time, center stage is always a very space limited area. Whereas when you've got a full set like this, center stage can be very big. It can be the whole set. So action can be going on in places that action isn't going on in just a volume, which is much more like almost a stage set, whereas this is much more like kind of on location. And it really works, which isn't to say there aren't some locations that I'm sure they did use a single set or the volume for. I mean, if you're doing an in internal spaceship shot, it's not like you need to be in this huge, vast environment or outdoors. But for a lot of the other shots on planets and everything else, you really get the feeling that they took advantage of being able to build on real sets in a, in a very, very good way. And we have to give a lot of credit to Diego Luna, who plays Cassian Andor. He well, is, the entire cast is... Yeah, the entire yeah. cast is excellent. He is, I think... I mean, he kind of has to carry the show. I don't feel like he has to carry the show because there are so many other people, so many other moving parts... I think that he very much does contribute and he's a major point, but I think that a lot of the other cast really helped to hold this show up. Not that it needs to be held right. up per se. They're all three dimensional, that's for sure. His name is on the marquee. I mean, he, it, it is literally named after him and I think he really does a great job. Speaking of the of the supporting characters that are excellent, Stellan Skarsgård does an amazing job. Yeah, there is a, one particular sequence where he is confronted by the empire out in space that is really just lovely to watch sure and not to mention you know i know that it's it's been pulled out both as quotes and and as a clip by people one of his his op operatives at one point asks him what he's had to sacrifice and it, it to for for his role in all of this. Stellan Skarsgård. For, right, right. What Stellan Skarsgård has had to sacrifice. And he gives a speech that is intensely emotional and really resonated with what the cost, the, the emotional, the personal cost to these people and is. There's a lot of supposition out there on the internet that because of that speech that people feel like he is one of the Jedi that escaped the Order. Could be. We can get more into that in the in the spoiler section, what, what some of the, the hypotheses are. But in the spoiler-free section, I mean, if you haven't figured it out just from us talking about it, this show was a real revelation among the Star Wars shows. And we've been very positive about the Star Wars shows. You know, some are amazing, some, but none have been bad. They've all yeah, been good, I mean, but this is well, something else. I felt like Boba Fett's show, the one around Boba Fett was okay. Right. The thing that, that helped me understand Boba Fett was when I stopped thinking of it so much as a series, as a sort of short story of Mando and friends. And then the fact that it, we really don't know what Boba Fett wants, it doesn't matter as much because it's really just, and here's a vignette about one of Mando's friends. And then the end is Mando, which I can't have enough of him and Grogu. Just you put the, those two on screen and it's magic. So the fact that the Boba Fett stuff was, yeah, it was fine. But that's the thing. That's as bad as it gets is fine. There's, there's I not think been a Star Wars show that's been bad. Mandalorian season one was exceptional. Exceptional. And I think that I wouldn't even compare them one to one, but Andor is exceptional. Yeah. I, it is definitely in tier one, absolutely. Andor is in tier one of the Star Wars shows. It's in tier one of all of the shows on TV for this year. Yeah, it was just a great show, period. Yes. Absolutely. Well, I think we're done with the spoiler-free section. Yes. So, three, two, one, spoilers! I think the main thing in the spoiler-free section is talking about 
how people think that Stellan Skarsgård's character, and the character is named, but I don't know what it is, that they really think that he is one of the Jedi, and there's been all kinds of theories that maybe he's one of the Jedi's... Luthen. Luthen, that maybe he was introduced in the comics, that maybe he's from the video games. Whatever it is, I don't know enough about the comics or the... I, I don't know enough about the extended world to be able to have an opinion on that. But I would say this. One of the strengths I feel of season one, at least, and one of the reasons, like you said, it's just a great show that happens to be set in the Star Wars universe, is it doesn't deal with Jedi and all of the kind of more mystical, magical, heroic Star Wars characters. That it is just street level people trying to make it day to day and if Luthien is a Jedi, Luthen. if Luthen is a Jedi, okay, cool, but he doesn't need to be for the story. And I think that you really get to, you get to see how Andor is such a problem solver, mm -hmm. that he's able to, you hand him just a whole bunch of just spare parts, and he sees how all of them can come together to create something. Yeah. And he does that with the different moving parts. He's recruited to help with the heist and he sees the holes and what they might not have figured out and kind of fills those in. And then you have him imprisoned in basically a prison that there's no escape from. And he figures out a way that they can escape. Well, if we're talking about the prison escape, that was so, so amazing. And there is one one line apparently that, and I got I got that you didn't, it didn't you didn't seem as affected. But when he asks Andy Circus's character how many guards, and he refuses to answer, and then eventually Andy Circus's character realizes that Andor is correct. He's not going to get out, and this is where he's going to die. And but Andor knows that he needs Kino. And, you know, Andy Serkis, he right. needs Kino in order to make this happen because Kino is a leader and people see him as a leader. Right. Andor hasn't been there long enough for people to see. And he doesn't really, I don't think he views himself as a leader. He's more a shadow operator. He's not so much the, the big face everybody sees making the inspiring speech. But when Kino tells him, when he finally asks how many guards, and he says never more than a dozen. Right. That's it's what like, you know. It's like you could hear a pin drop. Right, because that was the big moment. These simple words. That's when you know the plans are being made. And you know, talk about an amazing performance. Andy Circus puts in He's a treasure. Just Whatever the role. most amazing performance as a prisoner who truly believes in the system, that he believes he's he's working for X number of days and, I for and one, he's gonna get out. I for one was never confused at him having two different characters, uh, portraying no, two different characters no, in the Star Wars universe. I don't care if they want to bring him in as a third character. Right. Put some makeup on him. Uh, give him some other... You know, but that's fine. Talk about lines of Kinos that, that I found intensely moving. So he is the one who basically rouses level after level of prisoners, which are effectively slave labor, to rebel in their ocean-set prison. They get to the top, and when everybody's jumping off to swim to shore... He sort of sadly but sweetly says, looks at Andor and, and, and just sort of says softly, I can't swim. So he was rousing everyone else to their freedom, knowing full well that this was it for him. And he even said at the beginning well, when this whole thing we started. we don't know what happened to him. Well, we don't know if other people helped him to shore or whatever. But I'm sure in his own mind, that's why he said it with such a, a, a wistful, sad, but sweet smile. Because... When, this, when the rebellion starts, even told Cassian, I'm already thinking of myself as a dead man. And, that was, and, and at the time, it's like, yeah, I was just thinking you've got to, you know, go for it. But no, at that moment, that's when you really realize what he meant. That he knew, he knew where he was. He knew he was over the ocean. He had to get shuttled there like everyone else. So he knew he's never getting out. But that didn't mean he wasn't going to help everyone else get out. Yeah. And that's just the kind of guy he was. And it was so deeply moving. And I don't you think, hope other people got him ashore. I don't sure. think that he started there, though. I think that Andor helped him get to that Right, place. right. Because he, he truly seemed to believe That's why he didn't want to rock the boat. Because right. he wanted 
he wanted to get out and he thought that that's what was going to happen. Yeah, he thought, you know, he, he took him at their word that he was only there for a limited amount of time. And it was only when he heard for an absolute fact that no, when people are quote unquote released, they're really just sent to another level. And when somebody found out about it, they just killed the whole level rather than let that word get around. At that point, it became clear, okay, there really is no escape. There's just, they're just using this slave labor. And as we find out, to build a Death Star. Well, we already kind of I mean, right. That everybody right everybody assumed that, but at the end they make it absolutely well, clear. Not the Death Star, but the actual. I think the um, the Planet Killer, the actual weapon. Well, that that is the Death Star. Yeah, but the it's li- the it's actual, specific yeah, weapon the, system yeah. in it. Yeah. So you know that was incredibly moving, but this was really a show of deeply incredibly moving things. You know, we you uh, have Mon Mothma, Mothma, who she has these gr- good intentions and. She just kind of gets trapped into the situation where in order to continue doing and fighting the good fight, she basically is given the choice to you, well, okay, I'll, I'll help you do that, but you're going to basically sell your daughter to me. Yeah, and it, it, she is kind of on the bad end of an arranged marriage where she and her husband have basically nothing in common and don't particularly like each other. And she wants her daughter to have a better life but then she realizes if she wants to keep number one if she wants to keep funding the rebellion but number two if she doesn't want to get caught funding the rebellion and herself thrown in one of these prisons or whatever that the only way and out I, is I like you like said i do like how she kind of throws suspicion on her husband's gambling yeah as to where the money might be going right well i mean he he made it easy by having a gambling problem <laughs> so <laughs> You know, he did, he did make it easy. It's definitely a very, very interesting and engaging and emotionally moving story. I have read online that season two is going to take place one year after the events of season one. So it's not like we're going to pick up and see where everybody is at this point. And I, and I did really just love how when Luthen is confronted with the Empire and he's got this, just this unassuming ship and he's trying to give them the codes he's trying to just quietly go by and they keep pushing him and pushing him until the until you find out that his his ship's pretty badass yeah (laughs) it was modded a little bit you really don't want to mess with it (laughs) yeah that because he was able to take on a few fighters right that that he he knows what he's doing in a big bad way so yeah like everybody every character has their moment to shine like what is traditional in Star Wars is that the bad the bad guys are really bad and they are really bad here. I think the series does a good job of giving them an inner life. But despite their inner life, it's not like you think, "Oh, that's that's sweet." No, it's not. They're they're still working hard to make life miserable for a whole lot of people. But they have inner lives. And so I think that's that is probably the best you can do to flesh out. And you, you get to follow them. Yeah. But you don't necessarily spend too much time. It's just enough to keep you interested in the character. Like Cyril Karn. Mm-hmm. You know, he wants to go after Endor. He knows that there's something going on. And when it all goes to shit, he's just, he's immobile. He right. can't. And because of that, he's basically kicked out. Right. And he still doesn't want to give up. Right. And that's, you know, he finds out that Deidre Miro, that that character, that she actually is doing what he wanted to do. And he tries to figure out how to latch on to her. And he, he does. Because when, in the end, when he's there, he saves her. So now you have this bond of two people that really understand that there's... There's more going on. And so what's it's funny... It'd be interesting where that goes. Well, and, and what's funny is it's like they make these three rounded three-dimensional characters, but at the same time, their ultimate goal is to do terrible things. And so it's, it's not like you want them to succeed. It's like, wow, I really hope that they kill Andor and squash the rebellion. No, you don't. But that doesn't mean that as individuals, they can't also have dreams and desires and stakes and everything else. And I think this series does a really good job of making sure that you know what every character wants along the way. And speaking of characters and what the characters want, there is a character that we have not addressed that Star Wars is very good at doing, and we've kind of mentioned this in previous, and that is 
droids. Right. Because you have Cassian's droid and, you know, it's very attached to his mom and Cassian. And when his mom dies, it doesn't want to leave. Right. It doesn't want to be alone. one of the other, one of Cassian's friends is going to be taking care of it. And he's like, oh, no, you need, you know, we need to go. He's like, and he understands that this machine, this droid just needs to stay there one more night. Right. Droid because rights. Because it's, it doesn't want to accept that she's gone and that its world is changing. Right. In a sense, you could say it is the, the droid that kicks off the rebellion on that planet. And Brasso, Brasso understands that. And even though it, it's silly to think that this droid has feelings. Right. But it does. But in some way, it, right. it does. Well, you know, that's, we're not there yet on our real Earth, but that's sort of the, the promise of, of machine learning and artificial intelligence, that it wasn't programmed in a factory to feel that way about Cassian's mother and about Cassian, but it learned over a lifetime to love her and to well, miss her. And it's been with them for right. so long. So, I mean, it's, yeah, and, you know, she even after death, she's still part of the resistance that's right his mom's still gonna fight and we haven't said anything about the music but the music's really good and one of the things that some things we watched on the internet pointed out is that every single episode the the, the, the instrumentation the instrumentation and the arrangement of the theme is changing to represent What's happening in Andor's and mind? And the sophistication yeah. of what's happening in the episode. You know, so if when there's like a funeral episode, it will be more, more of a drums, funeral march. Yeah. You know, it, and and it's well, it was. I think they even said that you know the drums that you're hearing in the intro, in the last episode, is what they were actually playing at the funeral. Yeah, and that's when you find out. Oh wait, the theme song is is what they're actually playing. So if you're not a Star Wars fan. You may still love this. You may still enjoy this, this show. I would not say that this show is fun. No. I would say that it is gritty, that it is intriguing, that it is very in-depth in terms... If you want to just watch it to enjoy it, you will. But if you want to like look for deeper hidden meaning in it, that's going to be there as well. And if you are a Star Wars fan, if you are like a diehard Star Wars fan who knows the extended universe incredibly well, there are a ton of Easter eggs all over this. There are. However, if I remember correctly, the director is not a Star Wars person. No, no. It was, it was other and, people who put and that's it in. What, that's what I think made this one stand out is that he was going to make an awesome show. Not an awesome Star Wars show. He's, he relied on other people to go ahead right. and you can, he probably said you could put it in as long as it doesn't mess with. Right. There's, there, there's enough time. people in the, in the props department and, and the production design who know Star Wars and that they can, they can handle all of that Without stuff. it upsetting what the story is doing. Yeah, absolutely. So if you haven't watched it, it's a, it's a great watch. And if you've watched it, go watch back it and watch it. <laughs> watch it again. See, again, I, so, I would say this is on par with the first season of Mandalorian in terms of the best of the Star Wars shows. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that season two of The Mandalorian is probably... It was good. It was good. Obi-Wan Kenobi was, you know, okay, good. And I think bottom for me is probably The Book of Boba Fett. The Book of Boba Fett. Or as I like to call it, The Mandalorian 2.5. <laughs> But yeah, and I'm not including any of the animated in that. Right, making. right, right. Which are their own thing and are also wonderful, but it's it's its own thing. It's part. It, it's its own deal. So yeah, this is great. Everybody, go catch it. Well, thank you, Golden. You're welcome. And that's it for this episode. You can find the show notes at theomegabeam.com/slash193. If you like this episode, please leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Your reviews help people who like this stuff find our podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions, please drop us a line at info at theomegabeam.com. Be good to yourselves and each other, and we'll catch you next time. The Omega Beam. Full stop.